into the third module uh, of term for the the uh, sorry third lecture of term for the module metaphysics. Um, so this lecture is going to be on uh, the subject of possible worlds, um, which is a, a kind of tool that metaphys metaphysicians often use in order to understand the nature of possibility. Um, this is an important topic. Um, not only in metaphysics, but it's also played an important role in uh, philosophy of language, uh, in semantics, um, uh, and also in uh, epistemology uh, and other fields. So probably at various points during your uh, studies in philosophy, you, you have or you will uh, come across the notion of possible worlds. So um, it's interesting to sort of investigate what exactly a possible world is supposed to be, and um, that's going to be the, the purpose of this lecture. So I'll go to the slides um, uh, and talk to the slides. So hopefully you can follow along um, uh, uh, with what I'm saying. Um, so I'll just make this uh, full screen. Um, so possible worlds is a topic. Um, and possible worlds, the idea is that they're supposed to help make sense of what are known as modal statements. So statements not about how things actually are, um, but statements about how things could have been or would have been, um, that, or, or how things had to be. Um, so there are lots of examples of modal statements in ordinary language. So you might ask, would Trump have been elected president if he hadn't been on The Apprentice? So that's a, uh, a counterfactual question. So contrary to fact, in fact, Trump was on The Apprentice and he was elected president. What we're interested in is uh, a possibility in which he uh, wasn't on The Apprentice. And the question is, in such a scenario, uh, would he have been elected president? Uh, likewise, we might ask, would global temperatures have been lower if uh, human industry hadn't emitted so much CO2? Um, again, another counterfactual, if things had been different, if CO2 emissions had been lower, uh, would uh, global temperatures have been lower? So the, these sorts of counterfactual questions, by the way, are relevant to causation. So uh, if we establish or if we think that uh, Trump wouldn't have been president if he hadn't been on The Apprentice, then we might think of his appearance on The Apprentice as a cause uh, of his being elected president. Causation is something that we're going to go on and look at uh, later in term. Likewise, we might think um, if it's true that uh, global temperatures would have been on average lower uh, without human emitted CO2, then again, we might think of CO2 emissions as uh, a, a cause of... Um, current global temperatures. Um, other sorts of modal questions we might ask, well, would the universe collapse in on itself if there were no dark energy? So uh, one hypothesis is that dark energy um, is uh, essentially counters uh, gravitational influences between um, observable matter um, and uh, stops the universe just collapsing in on itself under the force of gravitation. Um, could I have made different life choices than I actually did? This is something that one might wonder, right? So I might think, well, uh, what if I'd studied economics at um, university rather than philosophy? Would I now be rich? Um, could Brexit have been avoided? So um, you might wonder whether there was inevitability about Brexit or whether um, maybe there was something someone or some group of people could have done. Uh, to have prevented this from coming about. So again, we're we're in the realm of hypotheticals or counterfactuals, talking about what might have been rather than what actually is. Um, so I mean, from these examples, uh, we see that um, you know scientists um, reason counterfactually. Uh, so do philosophers. Um, uh, you know, historians, economists, and so on might 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 similarly reason. So historians might wonder about what would have happened if uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand hadn't been assassinated. Would the the First World War still have occurred? 
um, economists might wonder about um, uh, what would the economy now look like had uh, COVID not happened or had the 2007-8 financial crisis not happened and so on. Okay, so Lewis, David Lewis um, is a well-known philosopher. Um, he's contributed to uh, a, an awful lot of different uh, debates in philosophy. Um, and one crucial contribution that he's made is to uh, attempting to uh, provide a systematic understanding of these modal statements. Um, and in order to do so, he developed a uh, framework of so-called possible worlds. Um, the notion of a possible world isn't uh, entirely new with Lewis. Um, so, for instance, Leibniz uh, talked about ours being the best of all possible worlds. Leibniz roughly had, had in mind that um, God uh, was able to, to choose which uh, of the possible worlds to actualize, and he actualized the best one. Um, so, Obviously, you know, we might be sceptical of this for various reasons, uh, but, but you know, obviously Leibniz had a notion of possible worlds. Lewis is really kind of um, trying to argue uh, for the existence of these things and also to uh, show that we can use them in a rigorous semantics uh, for claims about what might have been. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you tr we're trying to depict possible worlds you might you might draw something like this um now uh it's important to note that okay yeah this 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 might be a nice sort of visual way of thinking about them but but don't be misled by world we mean an entire universe not something like a, a planet um so no, at least that's what lewis had in mind so uh, a whole space-time structure um uh, a universe in all its spatial extent from beginning to end. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. So Lewis thinks that possible worlds are ways things could be. They're complete or maximal thing way th ways things could be. So that's why it's that sort of completeness or maximality that implies that a possible world is going to be a whole space time, a whole universe, um, rather than uh, something smaller than a universe like a planet. Um, more sort of formally, um, Lewis understands this notion of maximality um, in terms of propositions. Uh, proposition is something like the meaning of a sentence. Um, so the idea is that every proposition uh, has a determinate truth value in each possible world. So there's enough going on in the possible world to make every sentence uh, true or false uh, determinately. Uh, there aren't, you know, things left out. If a, if a possible world were merely the size of a planet, then maybe there'd be some uh, questions that it fails to settle, like um, how big is the universe or something like that. Um, but given that a possible world is, is much larger, it's universe sized, then uh, the idea is going to settle all of these questions. So in, in in that sense, it's maximal. Now, Lewis advocates a position that has become known as extreme realism about possible worlds. Um, so he he claims that other possible worlds exist so that's what makes his view a realist view. He thinks possible worlds exist. They're not something like fictions, which is uh, a view that we'll come on to later. Uh, moreover, and I guess this is why people think he's an extreme realist, um, he thinks that other possible worlds, um, you know, worlds maybe where Trump wasn't on The Apprentice, um, are things of just the same sort as the actual world. Um, they're, they're in the same ontological category, if you like, as the actual world. The actual world's often denoted uh, using the at symbol. Um, and then he also adopts a thesis of so-called concreteness, which, you know, perhaps follows from this egalitarianism. 
um, namely that other possible worlds are composed, or at least partly composed, of concrete objects in a space-time structure. So, just as our actual world, our universe, consists in a space-time structure uh, with uh, objects in it, uh, concrete objects in it, so other possible worlds uh, consist in much the same thing, uh, space-time structures with concrete objects in them. What do we mean by concrete object? Well, uh, most sort of material objects would count as, well, I guess all material objects would count as concrete objects. So, um, for instance, uh, chairs, tables, um, electrons, uh, mountains, planets, um, uh, and so on. Um, the notion of a concrete object uh, might be uh, distinguished from uh, an abstract object. Um, so uh, the number nine is maybe a good example of an abstract object. Um, what's the difference? Well, I mean, it, you know, it's a bit um, contentious, but uh, roughly speaking, concrete objects are going to be those that uh, take up space. Um, whereas abstract objects um, don't take up space. They might be thought of as sort of a uh, non-spatial or non-temporal. Um, so arguably the number nine is like that, and if so, then it's going to be an abstract object rather than a concrete object. So the point is that um, other possible worlds um, include concrete objects just like our actual world does. Now, what about abstract objects? Well, um, if we think of abstract objects as part of our world, right? So maybe the number nine is in some sense part of our world, even though it doesn't occupy space time. Um, then presumably on Lewis's view, it's also going to be part of um, other possible worlds. Um, and that would seem to follow from the thesis of egalitarianism that... Um, uh, other possible worlds, uh, things of the same sort as uh, the actual world. Alternatively, you might think um, that somehow abstract objects, just as they kind of transcend space and time, maybe they transcend possible worlds. So they're not properly speaking part of any one possible world. Um, so that there's sort of room for uh, different versions of the view here. Um, I don't, uh, Lewis isn't particularly explicit on on his thoughts on this okay um okay so i mean i guess you could think of these uh three principles as the core tenets of lewis's realism or extreme realism if you like about possible worlds uh they exist they're things of the same sort as the actual world and they're at least partly constituted of concrete objects in the space-time structure. Um, but there are other subsidiary theses that he adopts. So one is the, the principle uh, that's sometimes known as isolation, namely that possible worlds are spatio-temporally and causally isolated from one another. So it follows from that, for instance, you can't travel between possible worlds. Um, which sort of makes sense, you know, if a possible world is a, something like a complete universe, a complete space-time structure, then there'd be no way of going from one to the other because um, uh, that would imply that there was somehow space-time connecting uh, the two uh, worlds which would then imply that neither of them was really a complete space-time structure because uh, you, you could go beyond it, so there would be more space-time that's connected to it um, that goes beyond it. So it would seem that um, this principle of isolation at least arguably follows from the core tenets of maximality and concreteness that Lewis adopts. Um, now... Uh, one interesting implication of isolation is that no, at least no concrete object inhabits multiple worlds. Um, and that's because if there were an object, O, uh, that inhabited more than one world, then 
it, that inhabitant uh, would be spatiotemporally and maybe causally related to objects um, in each of the worlds, right? So suppose that um, I, uh, myself, uh, I mean, were an inhabitant of uh, the actual world and another possible world, call it W, um, then that would imply that the an inhabitant of the actual world, namely me, is spatiotemporally and maybe causally related uh, to objects in world W, and that would just violate the principle of isolation. So Lewis endorses isolation. Now, what this means, and we'll come back to the relevance of this momentarily, is that... Um, we can't literally say that um, obviously I exist in other possible worlds. Um, and this is interesting, right? Because if you think about, say, the Trump example, we were sort of asking whether it was possible, whether Trump would have become president had he not been in The Apprentice. And the suggestion was, we're going uh, to, order, to understand that, we're going to appeal. Uh, to a possible world in which he's not on The Apprentice and see whether he's president in that world. But now, actually, Lewis is saying that, strictly speaking, an object like Trump um, can only inhabit one possible world. So, actually, there is no Trump in any other possible world, not literally speaking, only here in the actual world. So, Lewis's sort of way around that is to appeal to the notion of counterparts. So, um, objects, um, an object is a counterpart of Trump, say. We might have a person in World W that's a counterpart of Trump. Um, if that object, that person, sufficiently resembles Trump, um, and, you know, there's then going to be a discussion about what constitutes sufficient resemblance. Um, but although it resembles Trump, uh, although this person resembles Trump, they're not strictly numerically identical to Trump uh, on Lewis's view of counterparts. So again, we'll, that's something we're going to come back to in a moment. Another example, so here's my French bulldog, George. Um, I might ask, uh, could George have uh, been a different colour? Could he have been white? Um, so the idea is that um, in answering that question, uh, I'm appealing to a possible world or possible worlds. Um, and the question is, in those worlds, is there a counterpart uh, of George uh, who sufficiently resembles him in other respects, but who is uh, a different colour? Okay. So more, we'll come back to the topic of counterparts later because it, it throws up some... Um, philosophical challenges okay but just to finish off introducing lewis's lewis's view um it's worth noting that he adopts also what is known as uh, the indexical analysis of actuality right what does that mean well what it means is that the phrase the actual world he takes that phrase to be an indexical uh, in the sense that it refers to which other, whichever world the utterer inhabits. So, in other words, when I say the actual world, I'm referring to the world that I'm in. But my counterpart in world W uh, could equally utter the phrase the actual world. Um, and it would re refer just to whatever world he's in, namely W. It wouldn't refer to the world that I'm in. I mean, so uh, it's an indexical. Um, other examples of index. So basically, indexical uh, is a word or a phrase uh, the reference of which depends upon uh, the context of utterance. So who it's uttered by, uh, the place or time. Um, um, etc where it's where it's uttered so other examples of indexicals include i so if i say i then i refer to luke fenton glynn if any of you says i then you refer to somebody else not to luke fenton glynn um, another example would be here so uh, 
Um, it, when I say here, um, I'm referring to a particular place in Cambridge where I'm currently sitting. Uh, when any of you says here, you're referring to a different place. Um, and likewise now, right? So if I say now, then um, I'm referring to the time of recording. Um, if you said now upon hearing this, then you'd be referring to the time um, at which you you're you're hearing the recording. So um, so just so th these are all examples of indexicals. Uh, their reference depends upon the context of utterance. And Lewis's claim is that the phrase "the actual world" or phrases like uh, "actually" um, uh, are likewise indexical, referring to the the world uh, that the utterer occupies. Okay, so why be realists about possible worlds? What's the argument for realism? And we'll see some alternatives to realism shortly. Well, Lewis himself argues that ordinary language supports realism. Um, so often um, philosophers like where possible to, to um, make sense of ordinary language to uh, adopt theories that um, are close to ordinary language that don't uh, sort of systematically violate our ordinary ways of talking and thinking. So it's a sort of common sense, if you like, approach to philosophy. Um, and, you know, of course, you can argue, you, you, you can sort of debate about whether, you know, that's the right approach. That, that This is probably not the, 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 the time for, for such, a uh, sorry, uh, such a methodological discussion. Um, but certainly Lewis um, uh, thinks that uh, ordinary language supports realism about uh, possible worlds and that that's there for a reason to adopt realism. Um, so how does ordinary language, according to Lewis, uh, support realism about possible worlds? Well, Lewis says, look, we talk as though things could have been different. So, um, you know, I say, well, you know, I, I might not have been a philosopher. I might have been an economist or more may, maybe slightly more boringly uh, I might have decided to go to the supermarket rather than recording this lecture right now um, you know you can think of sort of various examples more or less profound where we speak of um, uh, as though things could have been different we could have made different choices uh, different things could have happened you know your numbers could have come up in the lottery uh, and you could have been um, on a private jet to a uh, a tropical island by now. Um, so this ordinary talk of as though things could have been different, Lewis suggests we can just paraphrase it so that when we say things could have been different, this can be paraphrased as saying there are ways things might have been besides the way they actually are. And that seems harmless enough. It seems, you know, perfectly legitimate and perfectly reasonable to say there are ways things might have been besides the way they actually are. Now, Lewis notes that um, this second sentence, there are ways things might have been besides the way they actually are, implies that there are ways things might have been. In other words, ways things might have been exist, right? So I guess for those of you who've done first order logic, you recognize the expression there are as an existential quantifier. It's saying such things exist. Um, and so Lewis says that, well, these ways things might have been are what he's calling possible worlds. So ordinary language quantifies over ways things might have been. Uh, in other words, commits to their existence. Um, and Lewis says, well, you know, it's these... Uh, things that ordinary language is committing to that he's calling possible worlds. Now, I mean, Lewis's argument in some sense isn't totally conclusive. So first of all, you might think, well, uh, is this a sensible methodological approach to adopt a kind of common sense ontology uh, on which uh, we should 
where we can endorse the existence of things that are implied by ordinary language ways of speaking. So that's one sort of objection you might have. Um, and that's a really interesting question. Um, but there are other sorts of objections too, right? So um, you might think that, well, and I think this is this is this is particularly um, a fairly persuasive objection. You might say, well, okay, ordinary language supports the idea that there are ways things might have been. Uh, maybe we could call these possible worlds, and uh, if we endorse our existence, that gives us a a realism about possible worlds. Um, but this does only look like an argument for realism about possible worlds. It doesn't look like a um, um, an argument necessarily for Lewis's version of realism, uh, the extreme realism. So it doesn't seem obvious that um, we're, we're justified in thinking that these ways things might have been are concrete universes on an ontological par with their own, right? So it doesn't seem that Lewis's argument establishes that conclusion. In fact, you might think, well, it doesn't even really establish this maximality principle about possible worlds, right? So we say there are ways things might have been, um, but uh, do we do we thereby commit to these ways things might have been have been being ma maximal so um determining a truth value for every proposition or being whole universes or something like that um it's not obvious that it does so you might think kind of uh you know lewis has provided an argument for a sort of form of realism but 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 maybe not for um, the sort of realism that he wants to endorse. And L Lewis is reasonably upfront about this. So he, he acknowledges that um, this argument could equally support a more moderate form of realism that, that we'll come on to discuss. But he thinks there are separate objections to moderate realism, uh, or what he calls the sats or fake realism. Um and uh, and so he thinks, therefore, we should adopt extreme realism. Okay. So what should we think about extreme realism? Um, I mean, obviously, uh, we might be better placed to evaluate it in more detail once we've got the rivals on the table, which we'll come back to. But you might immediately think, well, um, extreme realism kind of looks ontologically extravagant so maybe some sort of violation of a principle like Occam's razor um it posits many and in fact Lewis thinks there are infinitely many possible worlds and if we adopt the extreme realist view that uh, these are all concrete universes on a par with their own then this sort of looks extravagant the idea that there should be infinitely many universes besides their own uh, wouldn't it be better if we could somehow just make do with our own universe, at least as the only uh, concrete one? Now, Lewis himself anticipates this objection uh, and makes a reply to it. So in reply, Lewis says, so you can think of sort of Occam's razor as a sort of parsimony principle. So other things being equal, we should prefer the, the simpler theory, the one that posits maybe fewer entities. Um, and by positing infinitely many uh, concrete universes, uh, you might think L Lewis's uh, view violates this principle. Now, so Lewis distinguishes between two kinds of parsimony, uh, what he calls qualitative parsimony and what he calls quantitative parsimony. Um, so uh, a theory on his view is qualitatively parsimonious, to the extent that it posits fewer kinds of things. Uh, on the other hand, it's quantitatively parsimonious uh, to the extent that it posits fewer instances of each of those kinds, right? So think about, just by way of example, think about scientific theories of particle physics, right? So you could imagine, you know, I think there's there's a reasonable amount of agreement about um, what fundamental particles exist. 
but at least sort of in theory you could imagine um that you might have disagreements so you could have one scientific theory positing more types of fundamental particle uh, than another uh, and so that would be a kind of qualitative unparsimony right so uh, positing more kinds of fundamental particle more types of fundamental particle um, a difference in quantitative parsimony on the other hand would be if you had two theories agree on what kinds of fundamental particles there were but one of those theories just said there are more instances of those kinds, more electrons, say, than the other theories. So maybe they both agree on the list of fundamental kinds of particles. They both agree that electrons are one kind of fundamental particle. It's just that, you know, one of the theories says, well, there's a trillion electrons. That's presumably a gross underestimate. Um, whereas the other says it's there's a trillion trillion electrons. Uh, then the latter theory would be less quantitatively parsimonious. Okay, so uh, that's quite a long explanation. But basically what Lewis ultimately says is what really matters in judging a theory is qualitative parsimony, not quantitative parsimony. So he thinks uh, that it's not really relevant uh, or not at least not as important whether a theory is quantitatively parsimonious. What's really important to what Occam's razor is getting at is qualitative parsimony. Now he says that his theory of possible worlds uh, is only unparsimonious in the quantitative sense. And that's because everybody, all theories are going to agree, or you know, all mainstream theories are going to agree um, that the actual world exists and that it's a concrete entity, uh, that is an entity that at least in part consists of concrete objects in a space-time structure. And Lewis says, well, you know, his theory agrees, but it just says there are a bunch of other instances of that kind, right? There are a bunch of possible worlds which are all on an ontological path. They're the same sort of thing, right? So there's no additional um, kind of thing that he's positing, just more instances of the same kind of thing. So just as a scientific theory, one scientific theory might say there are more electrons than another, even though they all agree, they both agree that uh, electrons are a fundamental kind of uh, uh, particle. Uh, he's saying that his view just says there are more concrete universes, uh, even though uh, both his and rival theories agree that um, concrete universes are a sort of entity that exists. It's just that the rivals say there's only one instance of uh, the kind concrete universe, whereas he, his theory says there are lots. Okay, another worry about, um, so, you know, Maybe maybe you find Lewis's response plausible, maybe not. Um, but there are other worries about his theory. So this principle of isolation might be troubling because, you know, often we talk about possible worlds, um, or at least we talk about possibility. And the idea is that uh, possible worlds are supposed to um, de determine the truth of our modal claims are claims about what's possible and so on um so for instance when i say um if trump hadn't been on the apprentice then he wouldn't have been president then the whole point of invoking possible worlds is to give an us an explanation uh of why that might be thought to be true but you know we might think that we you know either know or have reasonable beliefs about what counterfactuals are true, what, what possibilities obtain. Um, but if possible worlds are kinds of things that are totally isolated, causally and spatio-temporally from our own world, then you might wonder, well, how could we gain knowledge about what they're like? How could we know what goes on in these possible worlds, or how could we have reasonable belief about what goes on in these possible worlds um, if 
they're completely isolated from our own, right? So that's a sort of challenge for Lewis's extreme realism. Uh, and we'll see that perhaps some of the alternatives aren't confronted with um, quite as um, severe a challenge uh, in this respect. Um, and then another sort of objection that may have already occurred to you, uh, and actually I sort of anticipated to some extent, was um, the the problem with counterparts, a problem with counterparts, right? So when we speak about possibility, uh, what could have happened, what would have happened, um, then, you know, we often talk about what could have happened or would have happened to a particular object um, that exists in our world. So, you know, I might speak about whether George, my dog, could have been a different colour, um, to use a Trump example again, I, I speak about whether Trump would have been president if he weren't on The Apprentice. Now, the you know, it seems that I'm making a claim about Trump or about George the dog. Um, now, Lewis is telling us that actually Trump and George don't exist in other possible worlds, uh, but merely counterparts of them do. But you might sort of you might sort of wonder about this. So you might think, first of all, you know, so counterparthood is supposed to be determined by resemblance. Um, but um, one worry, I suppose, is that it might be that resemblance just isn't enough to pick out a unique counterpart of an object in another possible world. So maybe uh, in world W... Uh, there are lots of French bulldogs with, uh, you know, maybe similar personalities, uh, similar features uh, to George. Maybe uh, uh, maybe some of them are different colours from the colour George actually is. Maybe some of them are the same. Uh, so you might think, well, uh, is resemblance really enough to pick out uniquely a counterpart of George? that's going to ground claims about what might have been the case for George, what could have been the case for George, whether George could have been a different colour or not. Uh, so, and this is sort of related to the other sort of, another sort of worry. So, and the worry is that, you know, when we're making these claims, we really think we're talking about the entity in question, so George or Trump. Like, why should we care about whether another French bulldog that uh, resembles George, uh, but isn't George in another possible world is a different colour. Of what relevance really is that uh, to the question of whether George could have been a different colour? And likewise with Trump, you know, just because there's another possible world in which there's someone that resembles Trump and who isn't on The Apprentice and maybe isn't president, why should we think that's relevant to the question about whether Trump himself uh, would have been president if he hadn't been on The Apprentice? Okay, so some some reasons, therefore, to explore an alternative. Um, so one alternative is moderate realism. Uh, Lewis, as I say, calls this a sad realism, or in other words, fake realism. Um, but, you know, actually, it seems a little bit unfair. It does seem to be a form of realism. It's just uh, basically a, a realism that rejects uh, Lewis's thesis of egalitarianism and his thesis of concreteness. So they accept that possible worlds exist. They just don't think that possible worlds are entities of the same ontological category as the actual world. So... For instance, they don't think of them as uh, space-time structures uh, that um, are inhabited by concrete objects. So one kind of influential version of moderate realism says that non-actual possible worlds are merely maximal consistent sets of propositions, right? So again, a... a um, a proposition is something like the meaning of a sentence. So uh, the reason we distinguish, well, one reason we distinguish sentences from propositions 
is the idea that the same proposition can be expressed, for instance, in different languages. So um, I can express um, uh, the same meaning in English as in French, for instance. So I could uh, either uh, say that it's raining in English or I could say that it's raining in French uh, and I'd be picking out the same proposition, namely that it's raining. So um, the idea is that possible worlds are maximal consistent sets of propositions. Um, so what this means is that um, these, so to say that they're consistent means they could all be true at once. Um, and to say that they're maximal is to say that you couldn't add a further uh, proposition to the set without uh, resulting in a set that couldn't all be true at once. Uh, so that's the, the maximality claim. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's a sort of surrogate, if you like, for the, the, the maximality claim that Lewis himself adopts. So then, according to this view, George has white fur, is true in a possible world, if and only if there's a member of a maximal consistent set of propositions um, that includes the proposition George has white fur, um, uh, and that's just what it is, right? So uh, that's what it is for George to have white fur in a possible world. Okay, so concreteness and egalitarianism are ditched essentially on this version of moderate realism. So um, the view is that non-actual possible worlds are maximal consistent sets of propositions. Well, propositions and sets, um, and so sets of propositions, are normally thought of as abstract objects like numbers rather than concrete objects like chairs and tables. Um, so it I mean, normally the moderate realist would think that the actual world isn't merely a set of propositions. Uh, the actual world is is uh, a space-time structure with concrete objects in it. Um, but the idea is that non-actual possible worlds are, uh, are these abstract objects, these maximal consistent sets of propositions, uh, and therefore egalitarianism is rejected. But the view can still be realist, right? Because we can still be realist about abstract objects like propositions, numbers, and sets. Uh, and if we are, then um, this view is is going to be a version, a genuine version of realism. Okay, so what are the advantages of this view? Um, well, it appears, you know, you might think what Lewis says notwithstanding, it's somehow less ontologically extravagant. Um so, you know, we don't have to posit all of these other universes um, besides our own one. Um, I mean, we know there are sets of propositions, right? This isn't something, you know, we actually have to add to our ontology for the purposes of this theory. Um, you know, we, we just know there are propositions and sets and sets of propositions. And uh, so you might think we're not really adding anything to what we already know exists um, on this view. You might likewise think that, well, maybe it's less ep epistemologically problematic. So um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, concrete possible worlds besides the actual ones, one would be kind of isolated and inaccessible. Um, whereas in order to figure out what's possible on the, the, the present view, all we have to really figure out is what's consistent with what. Um, and that seems like a maybe a less mysterious project. Um, it also maybe reduces the difficulties of counterfactual talk about particular entities. So um, the we don't have to appeal to a counterpart theory, right? So if I want to talk about the possibility that George should have been white, um, what's grounding that on this view isn't the existence of a white French bulldog uh, that otherwise resembles George in an isolated space-time, uh, but merely the fact that the proposition um, George is white um, is a member of some or other maximal consistent set of propositions. 
Okay. Now, I suppose one of the key objections, and this is the objection that Lewis raises against moderate realism, is that actually it's arguably circular. Well, I mean, I guess um, it seems fairly clearly circular, uh, uh, one might say. Um, so Lewis points out that consistent, when we talk about maximal consistent set of propositions, well, what consistent means is that it's possible for all of the propositions to be true at once. But how do we understand that notion of possibility? Because possible worlds, after all, were introduced to understand the notion of possibility. So it seems like we're going in a circle. So we're saying that um, uh, what it is for something to be possible is for it to be part of a maximal consistent set of propositions. What is it for that set of propositions to be consistent? Well, it's it's possible for them all to be true together. But then the question re-arises, what do we mean by possible? Um, so it seems that we're going round in a circle. Um, and, you know, that, that, that seems like a fairly compelling objection. Now, uh, it would probably be quite difficult for the uh, moderate realist to argue that um, uh, their view was entirely free of circularity, especially if they adopt this version of moderate realism. Um, but they might say, well, maybe the, the circularity is not problematic, or they might try to to argue that, you know, although this sh this maybe shows that they can't reduce or eliminate modal talk um, in, in terms of something else, maybe they've somehow given an illuminating account of modal talk. Um, so this appeals to the idea that a philosophical theory uh, can be illuminating or helpful, even if it's not fully reductive. So again, a sort of methodological issue that probably you'll come across at various stages in your uh, uh, philosophical studies. But, you know, I mean, I think that most people are of the view that other things being equal, at least, would like a reductive theory um, of, of modality. Okay, so or maybe we're motivated by some of these objections to moderate realism to consider another alternative. Um, and this is, you know, the, I guess these are the, really the three major alternatives that uh, have been advocated um, for understanding uh, possibility talk. And this third um, alternative is one that on the face of it sounds very attractive, uh, but maybe when we look a bit closer, um, some of the uh, the gloss wears off. Um, and this um, this view is fictionalism, so it's a, a, a non-realist view, unlike the other two. So according to modal fictionalism, as it's called, possible worlds aren't real at all. They're fictional entities, like dragons are fictional entities. So... Um, They'd say, for instance, that it's fine, it's okay to rephrase an expression, a modal expression, like the philosophy, the UCL philosophy department could have been at 20 Gordon Square. So it, it happens that the department's located at 19 Gordon Square in the actual world. Uh, we might think that it could have been at 20 Gordon Square. Uh, a, a boring modal claim, but you know, quite a plausible one, nevertheless. Um, and they'd say, you know, it's fine to rephrase this, as Lewis and others um, would suggest, as there's a possible world where the philosophy department is at 20 Gordon Square. However, they're going to treat that latter expression. So remember, Lewis made a big deal about this because, um, you know, he said the fact that we could rephrase this as saying there's a way things might have been or a possible world. Uh, where the philosophy departments at 20 Gordon Square suggest that ordinary language is committed to the existence of these ways things might have been or possible worlds. Um, but actually, the fictionalist is going to say it's kind of not so fast, right? So, yeah, OK, we can rephrase it as there's a way things might have been or a possible world where the philosophy department is at 20 Gordon Square. However, they're going to say 
This second sentence, there's a possible world where the philosophy department is at 20 Gordon Square, is elliptical or shorthand for according to the hypothesis of possible worlds, there's a possible world where the philosophy department is at 20 Gordon Square. Now, this latter sentence, the one that starts according to the hypothesis of possible worlds, can be perfectly true even if there are no non-actual possible worlds. Um, so I think this is best understood with reference to a, an example, an analogy. So uh, consider the sentence, in the Harry Potter books, there are dragons. Well, it's true that in the Harry Potter books there are dragons, even though it's false that there are dragons. So straightforwardly, it's false. The, the sentence, there are dragons, is false. Um, but it's true that in the Harry Potter books, or according to the Harry Potter books, there are dragons. And so that's exactly what the fictionalist is saying, is going to say in this case, right? They're going to say it's false that there are possible worlds. Um, for instance, it's false that there's a possible world where uh, the philosophy department is at 20 Gordon Square. Nevertheless, it's true that according to the hypothesis or the fiction of possible worlds, there's a possible world where the philosophy department is at 20 Gordon Square. And they're going to say that the ordinary English is elliptical for this more convoluted expression, um, according to the hypothesis of possible worlds, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so basically the fictionalist, one way of thinking about this is that the fictionalist is treating, um, you know, philosophical treaties on possible worlds like Lewis's on the left as equivalent to works of fiction uh, like the Harry, Harry Potter books um, on the right. Um, so they're works of fiction, right? They're not reporting what's literally true. Like, you know, I guess the difference is that um, Lewis thought that what he was writing was the truth. Uh, he intended what he wrote to be the truth. Um, but uh, the fictionalist is going to say, well, it's not literally true, but it's a nice, it's a nice fiction, if you like. Um, whereas, of, of course, Rowling presumably thought that what she was writing was fiction. Um, okay. So what are the advantages of, of modal fictionalism? Well, uh, one advantage is ontological parsimony. So it, it just denies the existence of possible worlds. So, um, you know... Uh, other things being equal, it looks like, you know, a relatively simple theory. Uh, certainly it doesn't endorse anything like the extreme realism of Lewis, which might, you know, might be argued to be unparsimonious, even though Lewis has a way of responding to that. Um, and, I'm, you know, I mean, maybe this is a sort of key, um, the, 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 I mean, this tends to be the key uh, advantage put forward by uh, the the advocates of fictionalism, just that it, you know, it sort of gives us what we want, um, but we avoid, um, um, we, we just avoid this problem of having to posit uh, universes um, that uh, are isolated from our own, but, you know, are similar in nature to our own, which, you know, might strike you as, as quite a bizarre claim. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose another sort of thing that might be worth mentioning as well is that um, uh, maybe it overcomes some of the accessibility issues, right? So um, uh, you might think, well, when it comes to those concrete universes that are isolated from our own, there's a question about how we can know what goes on there. But, you know, if um, uh, possible worlds are very much a this-worldly fiction, then maybe the, the mystery about how we can know uh, uh about um what what goes on in them is is reduced right uh maybe we just need to read lewis's book or something like that um uh, um just as we'd read jk rowling's book to find out whether there were dragons in them but there are there are problems with fictionalism um <clears throat> and quite serious ones um so um one problem is that well we, you know, we've been talking about what could have been, what might have been, um, what would have been throughout the whole of human history, presumably, right? Humans just, it seems to be a very basic feature of human reasoning. 
that we reason counterfactually and we think about what could have been. It's maybe people have argued it's very closely bound up with our causal reasoning. And our causal reasoning is one of the, you know, crucial features of human rationality. Um, it's, you know, why we're we're so successful as a species that we're able to figure out what causes what. Um, where it, this enables us to manipulate and control the world around us to predict it and so on. Um, and, you know, so and, and that's bound up with the thought about, well, you know, what would happen if I were to um, uh, uh, do such and such, uh, you know, if I were to rub two sticks together or something like that, uh, then a fire would occur. Uh, this is sort of very much thought to be bound up with with that, um, a, a, a sort of causal knowledge of the world. So so you might say, well, OK, so what we're doing when we're talking about possible worlds is we're trying to give an account of what makes these possibility claims true. We're trying to give some sort of semantics for them. Um, but, you know, people were making these claims long before um, Lewis came along and wrote uh, what the fictionalist takes to be his great work of fiction on the plurality of worlds. Um, so this, it's sort of hard to see how the truth values of um, uh, uh, of, of our mode or talk could depend upon um, the, the, this fiction of possible worlds. Um, and, you know, even now, right, barely anybody has heard of Lewis's work, right? Um, uh, and yet everybody engages in modal reasoning um so yeah so so i mean that's a sort of bit of a puzzle um so how we could understand um uh something like uh there uh there could have been uh or trump trump uh, uh might not have been president um, it, as elliptical to, according to the fiction of possible worlds, Trump might not have been president, um, or there's a world in which Trump isn't president, um, if people who are perfectly comfortable with saying the former um, would have no idea about the fiction or the, the, the philosophical works about possible worlds that, that um, are supposed to um, ground the truth of that. Uh, that modal claim. Um, so you might say, and I guess the sort of uh, maybe the best response to this would be to say, well, you know, it's not like Lewis's work is the sort of definitive fiction. Um, rather, what it's doing is kind of regimenting everyday fictions that people invent in their imaginings of ways things could have been. So the sort of the rough idea would be that maybe we're all constantly engaged in a collective uh, act of fictionalizing when we talk about ways things could have been. Um, so these ways things could have been um, don't exist, but we sort of imagine them. Um, and maybe Lewis came along and just wrote down the most systematic um set of principles governing these 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 fictions um but there are other sorts of worries about fictionalism too so uh the one i'll end with is um actually kind of relates to a problem uh that was introduced uh for extreme realism so you know we might think in that context uh um uh, the worry is that when we talk about what might have happened to Trump, we what we want to know about or what we, we think we're talking about is what might have happened to Trump himself, not some counterpart of Trump. And likewise, when I'm thinking um, kind of actually about myself, you know, it sort of seems to matter to me that, you know, what I'm talking about is me myself, like I could have done something different, not someone who resembles me, a counterpart of me. But you get a sort of similar worry in the fictionalist case, um, which is, you know, well, we, we sort of care about ourselves and other real objects, uh, objects that exist in the actual world, I should say. Um, and we sort of care about what might have happened to these objects.
Um, so um, I suppose sort of maybe this is most easy to see when we think about ourselves or our loved ones. So um, you might, so when you think about what you could have done differently, um, you, you, this might be associated with, for instance, feelings like relief or regret, right? So maybe, you know, you regret um, um, some of your life choices, right? And you maybe think, well, you know, I could have chosen differently and this would have had different outcomes for me. Um, or maybe you're relieved, right? So you're very happy with your choices and you, you, you're relieved you didn't at a particular juncture make a different choice. Um, so we, we care deeply about what, what might have happened to us. Um, but you might wonder whether the fictionalists can really make sense of that because, um, you know, their understanding claims about what might have happened to us uh, in terms of fiction. So what, what does happen to a fictional entity? Um, so according to the fiction of possible worlds, um, I might have become an economist rather than a philosopher but you know why should i care what happens to some fictional version of me or some fictional entity now what i care about is what might have happened to me um and so you might think that the the fictionalist doesn't satisfactorily address that okay so you know as with um you know most of the topics we'll encounter this term um we're sort of you know it, the, i guess there's no sort of very clear winner in terms of the, the rival philosophical approaches. Um, there are different pros and cons to, to each of them. Um, and, uh, you know, different people favor different, different, different versions of these approaches. So again, you know, this is an in, another instance of an ongoing metaphysical debate um, um, that, you know, is partly interesting for that very reason that we, there's still things to be said um, and there's still, differences of opinion on what the best approach to to our modal talk is now as i say we're going to come we're going to sort of draw upon this theme um uh when we talk about causation because there's a as we'll see there's a prominent view of causation uh that seeks to understand causation in terms of counterfactuals about what what might have been um but before that we're gonna next week address the topic of um possibility uh and necessity um and uh, um and the relationship between that and identity so this is going to be uh, when we discuss identity we're going to be kind of drawing together uh two of our themes so so far we've spoken quite a lot about identity uh, across time and now we've spoken about possibility and necessity and we're going to be uh, drawing some of these themes together in next week's lecture. OK, thank you very much for listening. And I will speak to you all again uh, next week. Uh, bye.